A warm welcome and greetings in the lovely name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am Lauren Weiss from Grace Now Ministries, and I love having you join. Remember, these studies are part of part. In other words, it's important that you catch up with the previous studies and also that you remain faithful for future studies, because what we're covering today, we aim to start to wrap up in the next few sessions and give some other background details of gifts operating in, in uh, the book of Acts, which is going to be really interesting. So um, stick with us. We, we're working through Corinthians 13 and part of chapter 14 today, and we will finish that off in the next study. So enjoy the study and uh, be blessed, be encouraged and search the scriptures for yourself. Let's go over to our notes. We are moving on in the uh, book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, we spoke a little bit about charity last time and we're going to carry on in lesson number three. Please ensure that you have followed the previous lessons as it's really important uh, for you to, to have that background foundation. And again, I mentioned that these studies um, have some harsh truths in them. If you have not been exposed to sound doctrine and you don't understand the Bible this way, but I'd ask you to please have an open heart and to listen to what is being said and to pray about it and to examine the scriptures very carefully and prayerfully and just take them in their context and what they say literally. It's so important um, because these the things that we are saying are not here to offend or to hurt or to destroy anybody's faith, but it is actually to show you that there is an alternative to perhaps what you've been exposed to all your life and that there really is a way of truth that brings stability and comfort and that brings a completely clear understanding and what a peace of mind it brings when we understand God's work and how it it, how it enables us to, to live for him, to have a victory in our Christian walk. And often we are not able to answer questions that people ask. Um, and although we love the Lord, and I, don't, I do believe you love the Lord and you are faithful to the Lord, but in spite of that, you feel that something is not 100% right. And I promise you the means of rightly dividing the Bible will never take away anything from you as a believer, but it will enhance your Christian walk, enrich your life, and enrich your spirituality, that you will find a true spirituality that is balanced, an intelligent faith, a sensible understanding, and a great joy and peace will come as a result of this. Um, and of course, the most important thing is not so much how we feel about it, but you will be honoring the Lord according to his word, according to his working in us in this current time, and at the end of the day, it's not about pleasing man or churches or ourselves. It's about doing that which pleases the Lord, which makes effective the gospel so that souls are saved and that one day we shall not stand before him ashamed because we fail to examine the facts that God put right in our hands in his preserved, truthful and trustworthy word. So now we go on with Spiritual gifts, lesson number three. Paul had explained that any of the gifts and the good works or anything that a believer does without charity is of no spiritual value. Charity is a spiritual love and concern for others with no thought of self. No matter how great the things are that we as humans may do on earth, they mean absolutely nothing if to God if they're not done with the heart and the motivation of faith and charity. And this is an interesting thought. As we know, there is no good thing in us as humans, but God tells us that we can be vessels for his use and that he works effectually through us. So if we do not have faith, then we really are not a vessel that God can use for good. And the quality of charity is not a self-manufactured quality. It comes from the Holy Spirit working in us and through us. We'll explain the characteristics of charity and what it was composed of, which is what we looked at in our last lesson, he must lay this foundation before he can teach them, that's the Corinthians and us, of course, about the use and the order of these gifts, that authentic gifts from God are rooted in charity. Charity reflects the character of God. The Lord died for our sins in our place willingly with no thought for himself. There are so many glorious facets about our Lord and Savior, and these are just some of them. 
Now, Paul shows charity to his own nation when he declares his deep spiritual concern for them. We read in Romans 9, 2 to 3, he says that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. That is, to me, that's such an amazing concern that Paul had for that Israel would be saved. Now Paul's going to address the true purpose of gifts and why they were a temporary empowerment for the body of Christ until the time that the word of God had been completed and Paul had written down the full revelation of the mystery of the dispensation of grace. We pick it up from 1 Corinthians 13 verse 8. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. So Charity never fails. It has eternal characteristics of God. But Paul says prophecies shall fail. Now, that doesn't mean that there will no, be no longer any fulfillment of those prophecies that are already written in Scripture. It just means that new revelation of new prophecies um, would not need to be given because all the prophecies that were required for the present, the past, and the future had been completed and recorded in the Bible, and then therefore prophecy is no longer necessary once that had been done. Then he goes on and says, tongues shall cease. The supernatural ability to communicate in other languages was given as a sign to the Jews, note, to the Jews, to evidence that God was now offering salvation to the Gentiles directly by grace, and it was no longer through the nation of a believing Israel. Because Israel had fallen in unbelief, the Lord now brought in a different system, distinct system, the dispensation of grace. So tongues was a temporary gift to that generation of Gentiles at that time, and we're going to study a little bit more about that in future studies. Then he says knowledge shall vanish away. Again, this is a supernatural impartation of knowledge. We know that because obviously natural knowledge has not ceased. This was the type of knowledge that Peter had when dealing with Ananias and Sapphira. You read that in Acts 5 verse 1 to 5. He had knowledge of their plan and their motive because of the Holy Spirit. It was a supernatural insight that Peter had. So uh, talking about the completion of the word of God, I want to take a cross-reference reading from Colossians 1, 25 to 26, where Paul writes, Wherefore I am made a minister, that's Paul, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God. So there Paul is saying his job is to complete that word, fulfill all of God's word that we would require. And he goes on and explains what is he fulfilling? Even the mystery which had been hid from, gen from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Now notice the words that Paul uses. Fail, cease, and vanish away. I mean, that should be really clear enough for us to understand. Verse 9 goes on and says, We know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So to know in part means you have partial knowledge. In other words, you don't know the whole thing. Paul says when full knowledge comes, then partial knowledge will not exist. It, it, that just makes sense. That's just logical. Some folks teach that this perfect being referred to in this verse is the second coming of the Lord or when we go to heaven. But there's nothing in the context to even suggest this. In fact, the context explains itself. If something is in part and then in full, we know that it means it's been completed. Many times in scripture, the word perfect is defined as complete. That which is perfect is the complete canon of scripture. God has not added one word to the Bible in at least 2,000 years. Once the full revelation given to Paul had been written as scripture and completed, as we read, in Colossians 1, 25 to 26, then knowledge and all that we need would be available to everyone in the written word of Scripture. Let's just have a look at 2 Chronicles 8, 16, where we understand here the, how the word perfect is used. Now, all the work of Solomon was prepared unto the day of the foundation of the house of the Lord until it was finished 
And so the house of the Lord was perfected. In Colossians 2.12, Paul writes and he says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in praise that he may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So you see the link between the word perfect be something being completed. So that is why we understand scripture was to be copied and distributed to all the churches at that time, even as it is today. Then Paul goes on, verse 11, he says, When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. Paul gives another simple in illustration to help us understand what he's saying. As a child puts away things as he matures, so the foundational gifts were to be put away as the body of Christ came to more perfect knowledge and understanding. Paul says, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. So he's explaining here the current situation as a time of transition until the full clarity comes. So he says it's like as if someone is looking in the, for a reflection in a dark glass versus one looking into a mirror. The image of our face is clear and we see ourselves as we are seen by others when you look into a mirror. James 1, 23 and 24 defines the glass as what we call a mirror. Let's just read that. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth on his way and straight away forget what manner of man he was. So interesting there we get to understand when, when Paul's talking about a glass, it's actually a, a mirror, it's a reflection. Verse 13 says, Now and now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. So Paul's teaching them some horizontal truths and some vertical truths, some things come at certain times for a purpose, for a period, for a program, and then other things will be remain will remain consistent throughout time. Uh, we've spoken about that in previous Bible studies, so I trust that you understand what we're talking about when we refer to horizontal truths and vertical truths. Okay, some things were temporal and some were not. Paul assures them that the more excellent things will abide through the transitional time, and he mentions them as faith, hope, and charity. And he says the greatest of this, the greatest is charity. Moving on to 1 Corinthians 14, we pick it up at verse 1. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that he may prophesy. So he's addressing them as a church group, not as individuals when he says they are to desire gifts, but rather to prophesy. So he's addressing the whole group and he says, rather be involved in prophesying of all the, the gifts he's, he's explained, how important this one really is. So as the Corinthians and us can now understand more about spiritual gifts, Paul will give them the rules and the correct way to that the gifts, especially tongues, are to operate in line with God's will and his order. So if we read in 14 verse 2, he says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. So if they speak in an unknown tongue, now an unknown tongue is not gibberish. It means it's a language that they don't know. So if I spoke to you in Gaelic, very few of you would know what that was. Um, I would know, but you wouldn't know. And of course, God would know. Okay, so so that unknown tongue is referring to, is to an unknown language, but they just don't know it themselves. And he goes on and he says, if they prophesy, that would result in edification, exhortation and comfort for all of the church so that all could benefit, not just one person. So he explains that in verse 4, we read, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edify the church. Now remember the link and the importance, the greatest thing being charity. And here he's talking about the fact that whatever we do should be in charity, which is the purpose to edify and build up the whole church. 
He goes on and he says, I would that he all spoke with tongues, but rather that he prophesied, for greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. There again is the reference to the fact that whatever we do in ministry as ambassadors for the Lord has to do with building other people up. It's, it's got to do with bringing others to know the Lord. It's not, it's not about what we can get out of it. So although the gift of tongues had a place at that time and it was valuable, prophecy was greater because it would result in edification of the church. So unless the tongue was interpreted so that everyone could understand. Verse 6. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak unto you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesy or by doctrine? So it's apparent from Paul's instruction and focus that the gift of tongues was more a sensational gift and therefore the Corinthians were impressed by this gift. However, Paul says it is of little or no profit to them except if it's there is a revelation, a teaching, a knowledge, a prophesying, or doctrine, because that's what will bring the the understanding that people need. And even things without life-giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongues words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. So Paul brings another simple illustration using musical instruments to prove his point. Even things without life must give a distinct sound or they are useless. If they utter words that cannot be understood, then they speak into the air. We would say to a person, he speaks hot air. All the voices in the world, even animals and birds, etc., have signification, a purpose, a reason, and indicate some information. So gibberish is not from God. It's definitely not from his spirit. The chaos that was that goes on in, in current churches is, is not of the Spirit of the Lord. And then he goes on and he says, without this, it would be as the voice of a barbarian. And a barbarian is a foreigner. You know, you've met foreigners before. If you speak to them and they speak a different language, you can't understand what they say. And no one could understand. So this is what was going on for, the, for Paul to have to address this matter so strongly. He actually addresses them as babes, as immature believers. Um, and uh, I think you know what it's like if a child gets hold of a trumpet and he doesn't know how to play it. He makes a lot of noise that is not very harmonious or melodious. It's just chaos. So we send him for lessons so that he can learn. Okay, verse 12 says, Even so he, for as much as he were zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that he may excel to the edifying of the church. Again, Paul brings back the issue of charity. Remember, the greatest of these is charity. He brings it back. Charity edifies. So they had a zeal to serve the Lord, as many believers today do have, as many Christians in churches do. And Paul in encourages them to, to excel in their service for the betterment and the building up of the body of, the, of Christ, the church. He goes on and he says, wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. So tongues were to be spoken. If they were to be spoken, then they must be interpreted. If there's no understanding, then it is unfruitful. It's pointless and an indictment against the Corinthians. Verse 15, he says, what is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Else, when those thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say, Amen, at thy giving of thanks, seeing as he understandeth not what thou sayest? For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. There's your, the word again. Paul is hammering this home. It's not about us. It's about 
building up others. Thus, anyone using the gift must do so with understanding, otherwise tongues would not be a blessing to the unlearned among them. No one would be able to agree with them if they could not understand what was going on, and no one would be edified. Thank you for joining. I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Blessings and go read your scriptures. Till next time. Mm -hmm.